Now, welcome back, everybody. This is the bit you've all been waiting for, all the hard questions um, and hopefully easy answers. So um, there are no secrets in this room. If you've got an issue on your mind, feel free to ask. My colleagues will have um, roving mics around, so just um, put up your, your hand. We would ask um, that you just simply identify yourselves, your name and the organisation that you represent, and we'll be pleased to take um, whatever questions you have. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Keenan from Chagas. I'll start with an easy question. The timelines for the dates of submission. Will I take that? Yes. Yeah, okay. thank you. That's a really good... Um, I should have said that, Catherine, my apologies. We will officially be open until the end of the Assembly work, which is in November, but we will start looking at the submissions in September prior to the first autumn meeting, which will be the end of September. So really, I would, uh, I would encourage getting the submissions in earlier rather than later, because I feel that if you're in for the first review that we're going through them, we can then plan through the weekends. But obviously, see, our, all of the meetings will be online and perhaps people will have further submission or, or further input that they'd like to, to have in, in the assembly. And that's why we will keep it open until the end. Is that fair? Yeah. All right. Hey. Uh, thank you very much. Eddie Punch is my name from the Irish Cattle and Sheep Farmers Association. I think the Citizens' Assembly is, is a really fascinating model, and we know that it was maybe ahead of the politicians in terms of, for example, marriage equality. But on the other hand, I think from the perspective of people who talk, you know, who represent farmers in Brussels and Dublin, we have an increasing sense that for example, Brussels elite has become detached from the ordinary citizens and has a predetermined view of what, you know, the optimal outcome is. So, for example, there's an EU biodiversity strategy now, which is driven by Vice President Timmermans, which to some considerable extent has been foisted from top down. And you know, a central aspect of it is essentially the Vice President of the European Commission saying, let's have targets, let's have 30% of our land designated, let's have 10% of it completely, um, you know, extremely designated. These are figures plucked out of the sky, essentially, because the objective is to get, you know, what the elites in Brussels see as progress but without any real sense that there has been a deep consultation with the people. And so I suppose when I look at a citizens' assembly, my question is, how do we make sure, how can we be confident that the citizens' assembly is not um, over-influenced by, first, the fact that something must be done. The fact that it's been set up by the government means the government wants particular outcomes which the politicians don't have the self-confidence to put forward in their program for government or deliver themselves. How do we ensure that it is not over-influenced by, let's say, elites and academics, and doesn't take account of the economic impacts and the practical impacts of the people on the ground who will end up having to carry, if you like, the burden of what has to be, has to be done? Now, by the way, you know, I don't want to be completely negative because I think that Irish farmers have a really good story to tell. And I think to a certain extent, you know, the title biodiversity loss, I mean, maybe it should be called biodiversity gain because there's a lot that farmers can do and are doing because farmers are the custodian of the land. I was at a, at, at a farm walk of our organic chairman last week looking at all of the diverse things from red clover to tree planting to using, to using materials on the farm to improve soil structure. A lot of stuff being done by farmers. So there's a lot of positive stuff as well. But I think it really has to take account of the positive stuff that people are doing in the agriculture section. And, you know, biodiversity loss is more than about farmers. But, you know, you were saying um, that 6% of the people in the Citizens' Assembly are farmers. That's true. But there's, the likelihood is that the recommendations from this will potentially 50, 60, 70% be something 
that farmers have to deal with afterwards rather than everybody else. And, and I think we have to have, and I suppose I'm interested in your views on that, how we make sure that we don't have elites who don't have, if you like, the self-confidence to bring forward their own proposals, influencing it without actually looking at the practical realities on the ground and looking at the positives as well as the negatives. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate that. And it's great to get this aired here and now. Um, this is the first time that I've had to deal with questions like this, but they've been in my mind since I've been invited to this role. And I've heard the argument that why wasn't it called biodiversity gain? And there's merit to that. This is, however, what the government have given us in terms of this is what the Oireachtas gave us. And it was in response to having the biodiversity emergency called a number of years ago. So this is where it's coming from. Because with that, you know, we, we cannot deny that there is an emergency globally on, on biodiversity and, and looking at the numbers specifically for pollinators, which is going to be very important for many farmers, um, it's happening. But yes, the goal of the assembly is to stop it happening and to hopefully bring it back to restoration and biodiversity gain. So I do think that that, as one point, um, is important. Um, the fact that we want to take account of the economic impact, I think I, I referenced that specifically in my presentation, because we will get this, no doubt, aimed throughout the work of the Assembly We'll have one end of the spectrum telling us that we're absolutely not doing enough. And we're going to have the other end of the spectrum saying we're, we're asking everyone to do too much. And we really want to get the balance. Why? Because what we have to come up with will have to be implementable. And so with that in mind, I want to tell you that we'll be taking the economic impact into consideration, as well as the societal impact and as well as the impact on nature. And how will we do that? You, you, um, we will do that by getting in the people to give us the information, the statistics and the science. So as part of the scientific data, we will also be bringing in the costings on things and that will be part of the conversation. So no one's going into this with rose tinted glasses. These are going to be difficult conversations that we will have, but we're not going to be shying away from any aspect of it. So just to, to um, to refer to that as well. As opposed to, I can't really go back on, you know, deep consultation on the EU biodiversity strategy, but we are hoping to have consultation. This is why we're having this meeting today, because we want to speak to the farmers. Um, we want to specifically, you know, speak to, to farmers that may be impacted by whatever recommendations come out. And I don't know what the, nobody knows what those recommendations will be yet because that work hasn't started. Um, but we want to hear from you. And if it's individual farmers, fantastic. But if it's your own group, absolutely. Please, you know, bring those um, queries and those concerns into the submission as well. And we will try and bring that in as much as possible. Um, I recognize that, yes, the outcomes may well impact on the livelihoods of farmers, but actually I'd be hopeful that the outcomes of the assembly will be, will be outcomes for everybody because specifically, as you saw in the terms of reference, it's about policy and it's about coherent policy and it's about resourcing that. And if we are asking any one element of our economy to bear the brunt I would hope that that would be resourced, but we will be advised on that by what's happening currently in cap reforms, by what's happening currently in resourcing the Department of Agriculture, not just the NPWS. So again, Eddie, I just want to reassure you, we'll be hearing from all the relevant people on this and resourcing will be part of what we're asking to do because I understand the fears that farmers have. As I said to you, seven of my uncles are sheep farmers. I'm trying to have these conversations on the ground with people, you know, and already they see me as a, a hippie with bandana, tree hugging, you know, because I'm even opening the conversation up. But it's about opening the conversation up and not just farmers having to be um, educated on, on, on these conversations. It's everybody because we're dependent on our farmers and our farmers are the ones who are in touch with nature and land and we are depending on them. So it's about having this 
open conversation with everybody. So there I want to take you up on something because I do want to avoid this dichotomy and this extreme debate on urban versus rural and elite versus people on the ground because I don't think we're going to get anywhere if that's where we're coming from. I really think we need to bring it into the middle. I'm an academic and I don't see myself as an elite. I live in Dublin, but I'm a rural person. So I think in Ireland, specifically in Ireland, because we're such a small island nation and because so many of us have connections to all parts of the land, not just people who are maybe in cities for generations, and we do need to have conversations, but I'd like to keep that conversation respectful, okay? And this isn't, going to, this isn't about elitists coming up with recommendations. This is about assembly members coming up with recommendations. Part of my role as chair is to make sure that I defend the assembly members and people are respectful of them who are giving up their free time away from their families for weekends all across the autumn. They will be doing this work, they will be doing it carefully and we will be informing them as much as we can. So I'd like to keep that as a respectful conversation. That's what the whole purpose of the citizens' assembly is. It's not policy makers coming up with this, it's the citizens. So I want to reassure you that we will be having as much information as possible factual information, we'll be taking in the economic benefits, we'll be understanding that whatever is recommended needs to be resourced properly, and that we want to bring farmers into this conversation because we will, they matter, they matter fundamentally. But I'd like to keep that as a really respectful conversation. But I take your points and I ask you to submit them into the assembly work so that they're visible and that we can purposefully bring you into the conversations in the autumn. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to, rather than ask a question, just to say yeah, two sentences to introduce um, myself and my colleague. My name is Cleana Kimber. I'm Senior Counsel at the Bar of Ireland. I'm Chair of the Climate Bar Association. Um, and I'm accompanied today by my colleague, Donica Wolf BL. Um, we um, are of the view that the, the law and lawyers have a central place in biodiversity laws. If I might just give a very quick analogy. Um, people have been watching sport all over the weekend and the way the rules of the game determine how people are playing their sport, when you get a red card, when you get a yellow card, when you get sent off, that determines how people play the game. And law simply is the rules that people decide upon as to how to play the game. Law is central to this issue of biodiversity loss, and it's central to the issue of access to environmental justice for the ordinary citizen. And as barristers, uh, myself and my colleague Donica, um, are part of a team which is very keen to bring legal perspectives and to be a resource to assist with shaping laws uh, which will have a huge impact on this whole area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cleena. Thanks very much. Mary Tuberty representing the Heritage Council. One question and one suggestion. Question is about integration of this process with the preparation of the National Biodiversity Action Plan, which is going on at the moment. Um, how, how are you going to inform that, or how, what is the relationship between you? Um, the second one is a suggestion, really, about uh, um, learning and the operation of the Citizens' Assembly. Um, as part of Biodiversity Week this year, I ran um, a field trip to Holt to look at Goat Grazing Project, which was an innovative habitat management initiative run by Fingal County Council. And at that meeting, um, that one of the attendees said that she would write a report of the, of the field trip, because we had to write this up for the Heritage Council or for the funders. And uh, so she did. She didn't have a background in ecology or biodiversity at all, but she reported perfectly on you know, what had happened during the field trip. And the people in my organization were really impressed by that, and they all want to see her report. So I was wondering whether you should consider something like that for the Citizens' Assembly ask some of the members to record and report on meetings or learning or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's um, they're my contributions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, Art, could you tell us about 
how this will integrate into the National Biodiversity Action Plan. Yes, yeah, cer certainly. Um, the government's plan won't be published until they receive the recommendations of uh, the Citizens' Assembly. So the Biodiversity Action Plan will be influenced by the recommendations that the citizens make. So I think it was originally intended that the action plan would be published in the autumn, but now it's going to be delayed into early next year in order to facilitate the input of the, the work of the Assembly. Uh, on, on the second question, maybe, um, it's such an interesting one. For the, the first time at the weekend, we brought all of our Assembly members out on a field trip, and they visited three sites. They visited Dublin Port, Turvey, Natural Reserve and Bull Island um, as well. And after every site, each of the members um, filled out an evaluation form, what they enjoyed, what they liked to see. So we have all of this information on clipboards back in Citizens Assembly headquarters at the moment. So that will form an important part of the, uh, the input and how we proceed as well. So um, it is a great idea. And um, well, there's, nobody has a monopoly on great ideas. So it, we, we hope to capture all of that information from the weekend's work. Thanks, Mary. And just on that, um, some of the assembly members, some of them may be happy to, to speak with media and to, to say they're part of the, assembly, of the assembly. Some of them may not be. Some were interviewed by the Irish Times at the weekend and there was a lovely piece on the field trip with quotes from some of them from various different backgrounds. And I guess that's the type of informal reporting. But within our work so far, we are hearing a lot about um, informal education of wider public. Um, and potentially that might form part of the conversations in the autumn because it seems to be a theme that's coming up a lot. So I'm sure we'll be following up on that as well. Thank you. Maybe if I could just um, make one point, come back to Eddie's contribution earlier on. Um, it is often an accusation that's made of citizens' assemblies about predetermined outcomes. Um, I would love for you to meet our citizens and suggest to them already that they have their minds made up. Um, a great number of them um, know very little about biodiversity, um, but they received an invitation from Antishuk to take part in the Citizens' Assembly, and they are doing this because they want to make a contribution to public policy, and it, it's out of commitment to public service as well. You've got people from all backgrounds, all shapes, sizes, and uh, opinions as well, as we have done. I mean, this is Ireland's fifth time doing this. We're probably not bad at it um, at this particular point, but I would just like to reassure you, Eddie, that um, nobody has their mind made up already in relation to um, what the final report and recommendations might look like. Oh, sorry, and then we'll take you afterwards. Hi, Lisa D. Caleri from the Shared Island Unit in the Department of the Taoiseach. Um, so respecting the parameters of the Citizens' Assembly and that it's the state's response to the biodiversity crisis, but also recognising that the island of Ireland is a single biogeographic and ecological unit and that biodiversity doesn't recognise any borders, is there an attention or how best can we bring partners in Northern Ireland into the conversation so that we're looking at biodiversity loss in terms of all island solutions? That's a, it's a great question, Lisa Dee, and it's come up in our conversations already. In that regard, Mary Dobbs, who you would have seen, who's a lecturer um, in, the, in the, the School of Law in Maynooth, came from Queen's, actually, very recently. Um, she's very knowledgeable on Brexit, um, uh, so she's somebody who has that knowledge of the all-island space, and certainly we won't be avoiding that over the autumn. But it's a, it's a good point, and we, we heard it many times on the field trip that, you know, it's the flora and fa fauna don't recognise borders, and this is an island. Um, so, yeah, it, it has... It has come up in our conversations, and we will be. We have some experts to hand already on that. So thank you. And there I was mean, another. Sorry, to, just uh, on, on that point, um, Lisa D. You mean there are already a number of cross-border initiatives going on at the moment dealing with um, biodiversity that we're aware of. I mean, um, Derry City Council and Letterkenny, for instance, have a joint initiative where they're working quite closely together. So um, our colleagues here from Pi Communications um, have a film crew which we hope to send out um, over the summer months to capture 
um, some of these issues. Obviously, we can't get everybody into the, the, the Grand Hotel ballroom in Malahide, but we do hope to bring these stories. And again, I'll, if I'll come back to the point that um, Eddie made earlier, that there's an awful lot of work being done by members of the farming community. So please tell us the stories and, um, and we'll give you a platform to showcase these. So we have a film crew at our disposal, so give us a list of suggestions and we'll, we'll send them there to capture it. Thanks, Art. Thank you. Uh, John Inright, ICMSA. A um, couple of points, I suppose. Firstly, um, you mentioned the issue of resources going forward, and I suppose just to put, highlight our concerns on that, you know, over the last 30 years, we could identify several policy initiatives where there was recommendations with resources. The recommendations were implemented, the resources never, never turned up. You know, and this is a reality. And, you know, we meant, CAP was mentioned as well. Um, in the past, we had, I think, 66,000 farmers in an agri-environmental scheme. The proposal for the new cap is 50,000 farmers. You know, so you would be seriously concerned about the whole issue of resources. And I think just to endorse Eddie's point that whatever recommendations come forward, they need to be worked with at a farm level. We need to bring farmers with us. I think that's hugely important. And I think we need to recognise, you know, there is challenges at farm level, but there's some fantastic work being done on farms as well. And I think. The whole issue of biodiversity and water quality has come up to the fore in the last five years in farms. People mightn't believe it, but farmers are investing hugely in that area. It needs to be acknowledged. And I suppose the final point on sustainability, you know, we have the environmental issue, which is hugely important. The economic and social is also hugely important in relation to that. And I want to make one other final point, I suppose, the policy contradictions that, that are out there. For example, the Tarnished, I think, is at a WTO conference today where they're going to have a a recommendation in relation to food security. Myself and my president attended a meeting in March on a Monday where there was a proposal to curb production. On the Tuesday, we were at a meeting to try and produce more. You know, and this is what farmers have to deal with. You know, so we need to understand the policy failures, to be quite honest with you, in the past, and um, you know, work with farmers, because I think if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, I should have said that, actually, in response to, to Eddie's question. There's no doubt farmers have invested heavily and hugely in biodiversity and need more support in doing that. I completely recognise the frustrations in policies being um, outlined, but without the resourcing being implemented with them. Obviously, that's not anything the Citizens' Assembly can govern. But part of what I would hope to do as part of the work of the Citizens' Assembly is that whatever recommendations are there will be fully implemented. And part of that is getting everyone on board with them. And it's getting everyone to know about them, first of all, and then making sure everyone can keep the conversations going until they're properly implemented. So for me, this is part of a public engagement exercise. Part of the work we were specifically asked to do as well, as you would have seen in the terms of reference, are to look at those policy contradictions and try and get some policy co coherence. I can totally understand the frustration of hearing two different things on two different days. Again, it's not something that we have any control over, but we will have an awareness of them. And you know, they're already coming up in conversations that people are having on the bus, because everyone is tuned in now with food security and things like that. People are aware and they are confused. Um, and it's something certainly that we'll be having a look at the policies that exist and how they should be strengthened and implemented. Um, so, absolutely, we we take those points, and uh, we we will also we've also been asked we've asked our members um, to visit certain farming sites over the summer so that they'll get an idea of what happens on the ground. They'll get to talk to farmers, um, and I certainly will be doing it myself with friends and family. Um, our member of our EAG, James, um, he's our kind of ag policy expert, but he's also a part-time farmer. So we'll make sure that what we're what we're talking about is relevant and that it has relevance to farming lives. So we're not going to be doing this in a vacuum. Um, and because we have farmers on the assembly, you know, certainly people will stand up and they'll say, no, I disagree with this because X, Y, Z. And, and that's the conversations we'll be having. So I would hope to reassure you in that regard, it's something that I'm hopeful for in our own conversations over the autumn, that we will look at making things make sense. Yeah, well, if I could just add to the chairperson, maybe um, I agree with every single thing you said there, John. 
you know, so there's, um, there's no disagreement from the, the, the top table. Um, the one benefit, or one of the benefits of a citizens' assembly, is that it does help provide the clarity um, to these contradictions that exist. Sometimes there are contradictions because there are a number of different departments with different motivations, different stakeholders who are trying to appeal to their own constituencies. A citizens' assembly is is run out of the Taoiseach's department for exactly that purpose, that it can bring a whole of government perspective to it. So we'll be able to manage much better that conflict between competing individual departments too. So um, the, I see that as being a, a key strength as opposed to something that might pose us difficulties in the autumn. Thank you. Hello, um, Jean Moore from the National Economic and Social Council. Um, just want to commend you on, on starting so well this process. Um, we undertook a project um, following on from Lisa Dew's point uh, for a shared island, looking at climate biodiversity across the island, the challenges and opportunities. We did a consultation and Mary Dobbs is one of the people that was really helpful in that, so I'm delighted that she's, she's on your expert group. And one of the key points that came out of that work was that people uh, wanted to see biodiversity and climate in an integrated approach. Um, and that's something that we're trying to look at about policy integration of biodiversity and how, how you can do that in the policy system. Um, and, and just to, you, you mentioned um, that you were considering from the recommendations from the previous Citizens' Assembly on Climate. I just wanted to ask how, how are you going to go about that, you know, echoing what they said and how you did it. And then also just on the all, you know, the all island, shared island piece. Um, there are lots of projects happening and there are lots of really interesting examples of people trying to collaborate on that, both across border but also between climate and biodiversity. So um, we're happy to share that work with you and, and to help but just, um, just to echo the importance of, of taking that perspective. Thanks. Great. Thank you sincerely, Jean. Um, it's great to know that that work is underway um, and we'd be delighted to, to hear more about that because it's certainly something that will be very relevant to what we're doing. Um, as Art said, the examples, we'd love to hear from them. Um, so if, if you can encourage people to submit and, you know, potentially highlighting them and we can showcase them um, perhaps in the video or perhaps to bring them into conversations of the autumn, um, we'd be delighted um, to look at that as well. So thank you. It's, it's great to know that you're there and can potentially be um, a resource to look at in that regard as well. So thank you for that, Jean. Hello, uh, Pat Parry from the Irish Green Building Council. Um, I think it's important, uh, I just point out another um, deliberative dialogue that's also taking place at the moment, Project Woodland, um, which should feed into it as well. Uh, Project Woodland, Department of Agriculture, um, is aiming to um, set the policy to bring the level of woodland from 11% up to 18%. So they've been running a deliberative dialogue with 100 citizens as well. But uh, on, on the built environment, I think it's important that we don't see this as a rural uh, a rural urban divide. Mm -hmm. The built environment occupies a, a huge percentage of our land area. And I suppose from our, our planning over the past, or, or rather our approach to planning has been very dispersed. And you know we've occupied far more land than we really should for the population size and the national development plan will see um, 400,000 new homes built all of the infrastructure and all of the roads and that that on its own over the next 10 years would occupy something anywhere between 16,000 to 20,000 hectares all of that needs to be uh, part of a biodiversity um, you know a biodiversity plan how do we actually uh, move towards compact growth so I think it's important that we don't just focus on the rural but also on the combination of what we can do at our existing built environment and what we do, do build over the, the coming years Thank you for that, Pat, and um, I will respond to that question. And then, I'm so sorry, Jean, I forgot to say to you how, to f how we'll, we'll look at the climate um, findings, so we'll come back to that. Um, yes, the built environment, certainly, we're already, we already saw, actually, in the field trip that it's not that urban-rural divide and that, that planning policy needs to be coherent. So we... We're devising how we're going to parse up our time at the weekend at the moment, but planning is part of that. We haven't ignored it. 
um, because it'll be, it'll be one of the key and core areas. With that, we'll be looking at the policies that are already in place and as per the terms of reference, looking at how they can better support um, or, or curb biodiversity loss, which is the, the move of, of the Citizens' Assembly. So the question you ask, how do we move towards that? That's what we'll be trying to answer. Um, but we're not ignoring, we, we haven't, we realise it's a key part of the work that we will have to do. And it's not just about rural Ireland. No, urban has a huge part to play with that as well. So um, thank you for that, Pat. And yes, I heard about the deliberative democracy exercise that's happening with Woodland. And it'll be interesting to see what that comes up with as well. Of course, this is a different kettle of fish because this is a national citizens assembly but it's brilliant to see that other instruments of deliberative democracy are in use because it's great to, to bring that so I hope that um, that answers the question for you there. Um, Jean in terms of the citizens assembly on climate looking at the threats to biodiversity loss which again part of our terms of reference the five threats to biodiversity loss climate change is one of those and in that regard, it will be incorporated into our conversations to look at, well, if climate change is a threat to biodiversity loss, how do we curb that threat as per our terms of reference? And we'll look at what has already been recommended in that regard. Um, we obviously know that biodiversity loss also impacts on climate change. We won't be ignoring that fact, but we have to stay within our terms of reference. And so we won't be focusing on climate change specifically because that work's kind of already been done, but we won't we won't be avoiding it. Same as the the urban um, planning, um, it's something that we will be we're, we're cognizant of, and we won't be avoiding it. Um, thank you, uh, Louise Lennon from Irish Roar Link. Um, I suppose I, I don't want to repeat what has been said already, but uh, you know, just to echo a few of the points, um, you know, uh, like we'd have concerns as well around the farming community and I suppose there's that piece of engagement that needs to be done as well with 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 the farming communities and even a, you know knowledge transfer and peer learning piece um, but also I suppose need to look at you know what's already been done but at community level as well and there's a lot of community groups out there that are doing a lot of work to protect that their local biodiversity at a local level, um, and I suppose it's getting that you know if everyone does their bit that it can help. But you know th there are concerns about you know job losses. It's you know no different than the whole climate climate change conversation and um, jobs being lost. So there needs to be that you know economic piece done as well and practical piece, um, and I suppose highlighting what's been done and you know having that bottom-up approach to inform policy is is so important um and you know again how how others could learn and adopt and engaging with communities you know around information sharing that information and the knowledge you know sharing knowledge and also an education piece around you know what is biodiversity and why we need it and yeah. and that piece as well okay Thank, Thank you. you, Louise. I um, absolutely agree with everything that you've said there. I was at the National Biodiversity Conference last week and blown away by the examples of community groups working rural in Ireland. I was actually incredibly humbled by it because so many people are giving up so, many, so much time and energy to doing that across the country. And my thought was we need to hear more about this, not just in the Assembly, but nationwide, because a key to this is absolutely communities. And back to Eddie's point, Top down doesn't work. It has to be bottom up, supported by top down. Interestingly, this is something in my own research looking at curriculum reform, it's the same thing. You tell teachers what to do, it won't happen. It has to come from the ground up. And I'm seeing parallels in the conversations that are being had uh, with regards to you know, policies in this space as well. So I absolutely agree with you. Communities will have to be supported and we'll be hearing, definitely we'll be bringing in examples. Again, if there's particular examples, Louise from Rural Link, tell us about them, because we'd love to highlight them. Um, Absolutely, the economic piece has to be done and it's part of the work that we're already planning to get in the economist view on it. Nobody wants to see job losses out of this. In my head right now, 
there's potential for job gains, but I don't know that. We haven't spoken to the experts in that regard, the specialists. We haven't talked, spoken to the specialists in that regard, but we will. And this is where, again, I have respect that the Citizens' Assembly members will be creative in considering all of these things. Many of them come from rural Ireland, um, so it won't be something that they're not thinking of, that they're not already aware of. Um, so I hear your concerns for the farming community. We have those concerns as well, and let's work together on that. Please tell us about anything that you think should be highlighted. We will do our best to highlight them and bring them in. Um, but we, I absolutely appreciate this is a community initiative that needs to be recognised and done and there's a big education piece that's come up in all of our conversations from day one the assembly members have said this is education and not education in the formal sense a lot a lot of good work has actually already been done in schools but education of the wider community and and again we'll be thinking about how we can do that because it's part of our terms of reference so thank you for those points Louise. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much. Uh, my name is Pat Neville from Quilcher. So uh, thanks very much for the uh, session this morning, and particularly on how to uh, make a submission. And I can certainly say that Quilcher will be delighted to make a submission as well. We have a new strategy for forests. I guess people know that Quilcher managed the state forests of Ireland, which is about half of all of the forests in Ireland. So Quilcher are the biggest landowner in the country. Today, we manage about 20% of our forests for biodiversity. And in the next three years, we hope to increase that to 30%. So it'll be a, a massive increase in a very short time. It's science-led, so it's led by ecologists, and um, uh, they select and give management plans for us as well. Um, and we also, in the longer term, want to increase the overall amount of our forests between to a 50-50% basis, 50% for wood production and 50% for nature, but over the longer term to do that. So we'd be delighted to make a submission on this and to come in and talk to the Citizens' Assembly um, and just to, to put that out there as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Yeah. Forestry will be another part. We'll, we're going to run out of weekends very quickly, but we're going to do our best to get every, every aspect that we can into the conversations. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Geraldine O'Sullivan from the Irish Farmers Association. Uh, look again, I'd like to thank you for this morning. It's been very helpful. Um, I suppose I just want to talk about the cohesion policy piece again and stress. We have under the Climate Action Plan a um, series of measures that are to be introduced. Um, I'd like to see those and evaluate it on their potential for biodiversity gain as part of this process. In addition, you have the draft uh, river basin management plans. There's a lot of nature-based solutions within those and options within that and to look at then, that as well as part of this biodiversity gain. So these are all actions that are being asked of farmers now that need to be kind of incorporated and see what and evaluated from their biodiversity benefit. Um, I'd also like to say there's been lots of program schemes, measures, designations that have been introduced over the last decades. And in my experience, some of those have worked and some of those haven't. And I think that's hugely critical that we analyze those that have worked and those that haven't and the reasons behind it. Some of it may be economic, uh, some of it may be learning. I think learning is a huge, is a huge element as well. But we, we, we have a lot of things that we have done here in Ireland that haven't been successful in delivering the biodiversity that we want. So, I just don't want another layer of ass being put on people and all the citizens when we don't understand. So we need to know what work, what works, why it worked, and replicate that. So that would just be another piece of advice. Um, and look, very delighted to engage, delighted to be here, and uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Geraldine. Just on that, I'm not sure the Citizens' Assembly can participate in a work in a piece of work evaluating what's worked and what hasn't worked, but we'll certainly look to see who has done that, because there are certainly um, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in that in the universities um, and formerly the GMITs across the country on that. So we will have a look at that. And that's where part of our EAG members like uh, James Moran and, and, and Mary Dobbs, perhaps in that regard as well, will be able to guide us in looking for that. But I totally appreciate there's no point in having another piece of paper to say what should be done um, if we haven't already looked at well, what's there and what's been working. Um, and I guess in, in, in terms of our terms of reference, we will look at what's there um, and what perhaps needs to be strengthened. But I absolutely take that specific point into regard that, yes, there are policies under climate action and the, the river basin management plans 
and have they been evaluated for their biodiversity as well as their, their climate impact so I, I take that sincerely Geraldine thank you so much as well for coming because we really appreciate all the farming groups that are that are here today and we do want to have this conversation so we're delighted to have you all here and, and, and inputting thank you Hello, uh, Nuala Madigan, the Irish Peatland Conservation Council. Uh, just one question um, in relation to um, the kind of equalness of all the ecosystem services. So I've heard a lot this morning of the economic values of our biodiversity and, you know, that's totally appreciated. But they also have a very strong value in terms of their supporting and their regulating roles. So how during the Assembly will all of the values of our biodiversity be balanced and a balanced view shared to the citizens that it's not um, one-sided in any way? Thanks, Nuala. And I guess this is where uh, we will try and get that balance there by getting that spec those spectrum of voices that are out there. You know, we have them in the room that, you know, we're going to get accusations from all sides that we're not considering the economic, we're not considering the nature value, we're not considering the societal value. So we will do our utmost to make sure that first and foremost, what we're guided by are the, the, the scientific data that's there, the information that we have, and then we'll expand that conversation to make sure that we're looking at the impact economically, socially, and on the nature as well. But part of peatlands certainly will be the carbon sink that they provide. So we won't be avoiding that. And, and those, um, those sums are done. You know, people have them to hand. It's a matter of pulling it all together. And we will be doing that. So if I can assuage the fears, um, it's a task that's very daunting but it's certainly something that we'll try and tackle. Why? Because I want us all to be able to stand over the recommendations at the end of this and be able to say we did take into consideration all of these aspects and these are still the recommendations that the Assembly members came up with. Um, and that's all we can do. These 99 people, that is their responsibility to come up with to debate, to discuss. There will be a lot, a lot of discussion and conversation happening every weekend. So whatever comes out will be down to that but I will do my job in making sure that all the information is there for them to deliberate on. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Cleana. I should have perhaps said that at the beginning. That's Loch Corrib, which isn't where I originally grew up but it's where my dad lives in Kernamona and County Galway and that is home for me. When I see the car, my shoulders drop and I'll be going on Friday morning with my boys. Um, so I just wanted to put it there because the lake in and of itself has so many different values for so many different people. Um, and I guess that's all part of the balance. And if I had more life balance, I'd get more time to spend on it as well. Um, but that's where it is. And I really wanted to put that there because I do think it's important that we do recognise the conversation needs to be had. So I could be an urbanite living in County Dublin but I'm from rural Ireland and spent my days on bikes going to different farms and on the bog the odd time as well that is Irish people you know we're 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 a plethora of things and I really feel like we shouldn't try and divide our society we've seen what happens in democracies when that happens Citizens' Assembly is about conversation. So that's what I would hope that we can have over the next six months. Respectful conversation where every voice is listened to, and that includes all of the stakeholders as well. So maybe that's a good note to yes, conclude on. Indeed. Thank you again for coming. Engage with us. The email address is on the website. If there are any other ideas or considerations or elements that you think we should highlight or consider in our work as well, please do let us know. And I look forward to seeing some of you at least um, in the autumn in our work. But, but do engage with us. And thank you sincerely for taking the invitation for, uh, to, to come today. Thank you very much. Well done.